And now on to the main event. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Benjamin Olshan. Dr. Olshan earned a BA in classical history and languages from Williams College, followed by an MA and PhD from Institute for the History of Philo for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology at the University of Toronto in Canada. He is a Fulbright scholar, familiar with five languages, an artist, a talented musician, uh, a former professor who's traveled extensively across the globe. Uh, some of you may recognize Dr. Olshan from his 2015 CMS presentation on the mysteries of Marco Polo maps, but this evening he will be discussing his original research on Mughal artwork and its relationship to cartography, uh, in specific the globe upon which the Emperor Janagir is depicted uh, upon standing. So um, with such a broad range of interests and expertise, I'm hopeful he will be able to, to join us again in the future. Um, but at the risk of getting in my head myself, I will go ahead and turn it over now to Dr. Benjamin Olshan for his presentation titled Art, the Mughals and Janagi's Globe. Okay, thank you. Share my screen here. So thank you for that introduction and thank you everyone for coming to this session. Uh, one of the things actually I had neglected to include in this presentation that our host asked me just prior to our beginning uh, is how I got interested in this. So I am a historian of cartography among other things, but this is not really in my area. And the way I became interested in this was I live in Philadelphia and I go frequently to Washington, DC. And I went to one of the Smithsonian galleries and they actually had a exhibition of what are called Mughal miniatures. And we'll look at some of those tonight. And in looking at those, I noticed that they included tiny, tiny globes but that the globes were in great detail. And I realized that no one had really looked at the cartography of those globes. And that kind of launched me into this study, which I hope will become a paper or even a book. And I can talk about that at the end. So we're going to look <clears throat> at the beginning here about the Mughal Emperor Empire. And this was a huge uh, expanse of land that extended from what's Afghanistan now all the way to southern portion of India. And it flourished for a fairly long time from the 16th to the 19th century. And it kind of had its maximum extent in the 18th century. And it wasn't just a large empire in terms of geographical area, it was also very powerful and it had connections uh, throughout Asia and Europe. And then, of course, it began to diminish with British influence, uh, particularly the British East India Company, and then it ended up disappearing. But it's a very curious historical artifact because it was Indian, in quotes, but also really Persian and even Central Asian. So uh, enormous number of influences, not surprising given where it was located. And at its greatest extent, you can see here, it covered all of what is today modern India, as well as some regions beyond. Now, let's set that aside for a moment and look at this parallel topic, and the two will converge soon, this parallel topic of paintings in maps. Now, this is something that's been written about in the Western tradition, because in the Western art history tradition, there is in fact a long history of maps being included in artwork. And in particular, <clears throat> it's interesting to see the Dutch genre paintings because those have the same level of detail that we're gonna see in these Mughal artworks. Now in these Dutch works, it was very common to portray everyday objects and people very realistically, very accurately and even things, of course, like globes. Of course, the Dutch had their own empire and traded all over the world. And so it's not surprising that painters became interested in geography. And we see some wonderful examples here. We see, for example, uh, Vermeer, and he painted globes in several of his works. There's a work entitled uh, Allegory of the Catholic Faith, and that includes not just a globe, but an actual existing globe, uh, the 1618 globe of Hondius. 
And then we see at the bottom two other paintings, one called the astronomer and one called the geographer. And again, as physical objects, we see globes uh, depicted very, very clearly uh, in the settings of a studio here. Now, if we look closely, what we see is something very interesting from an artistic viewpoint, which is that the globes are really rendered with detail. Uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, among other things, I've been a professor of art, uh, particularly painting. I taught watercolor painting for a number of years. And we know that painters will not be specialists in everything. And so painters will often approximate an object, but we see actually the opposite happening here. We see almost a photographic attention to detail and an accurate rendering of what are clearly period globes. Now, if we compare this in a very broad sense to non-Western art, we see something very differently going on because that's a Western tradition. And in East Asian and South Asian art, typically we don't see that kind of realism. Traditional Chinese painting, for example, uh, did not employ what's called a vanishing point perspective. Uh, so what you see in this painting here, for example, is a form of perspective, but it's basically what's called planar perspective, a series of parallel lines to give some sense of depth, but it's not very sophisticated in terms of use of perspective, nor importantly, are objects rendered in that same kind of detail that we saw in those Dutch genre paintings. We see objects here in this Chinese piece but they're not really rendered in the kind of photorealism that we saw in the Dutch works. Now, in Persian and South Asian artistic traditions, we kind of have an almost in-between style because there is example of very detailed renderings in Persian miniature art. But again, we don't typically see the kind of photorealism that we would see in Vermeer. And I can talk about that a little bit in the question session if anyone is interested in why those Vermeer paintings are so photorealistic. Now, again, these Persian and South Asian artistic traditions have these wonderful renderings, but they're not really examples of accurate renderings of objects. However, there did arise this tradition of, in fact, very detailed and realistic renderings, especially of people and animals in South Asian art in this Mughal tradition. So there's the Mughal empire. It's a wealthy empire. A lot of work is being commissioned and you get as a result an incredible sophistication. So here you see an example. Again, the perspective is not particularly sophisticated, but the use of color, the realism in the figures, the fact that the figures are active and dynamic is a sign of a very particular style of painting. And then it's interesting to see that although we view this Mughal empire, this culture as Indian, in fact, it's drawing a great deal from a Persian tradition. And again, the Persian tradition has very detailed paintings. And what's interesting also is these were not just paintings for exhibition as we might have now. These were commission works that served as records, mementos, and even as we'll see propaganda pieces. And so the scenes here were purposely realistic scenes of court life, animals, scholarly study, etc. And here we see another example. Um, and this, again, if you look at the, the period of time, this is also important. This is the late 16th century. So there is contact with Europe. In Europe, there's a cartographic tradition and we are gonna see how these two things converge. Here's another example of this style. And what we see in particular are these albums of paintings that one emperor in particular, uh, Jahangir, he commissions these. So he rules for a little over 20 years and he commissions a, a collection of paintings, these albums. And these are what I actually saw in Washington, DC. Uh, the, the largest bulk of these paintings are in Ireland, uh, in fact. And these paintings have very, very meticulous detail. Here you see a scene of a crowd. 
And again, the perspective is not so important, but the realism of the figures and the animals is very, very important to the painter. We can see facial hair, we can see ethnic groups, we can see all kinds of things uh, in this style of art. And this painting was done by a painter named Abul Hassan, and he's going to be very important as we look at how these paintings engaged with cartography. Now, what's interesting is that this emperor, Jahangir, is actually portrayed in several paintings as a figure standing on a globe. So as I pointed out, these are very curious, but they represent yet another use for this kind of art, which is propaganda. So again, we have scenes of courtly life, we have renderings of scholarly study, we have the emperor and his family, but here we see that, but along with allegorical and symbolic renderings. And interestingly, Jahangir's name, uh, which is from Persian, actually means conqueror of the world. That's how he saw himself. And so it's not surprising that he's rendered on top of a globe. And what's interesting is first that this is shown over and over again. So there's several different renderings here. You can see three examples of him standing on a globe. So physically placed over a globe. That's the first interesting thing. And the second interesting thing is what these globes depict, how the artist has represented these globes. And just to take a, a quick art history detour, I've given all the, the detail below of where these pieces are kept and their titles, but we see they're quite curious. Here he is again, uh, he's, he's encountering other people, but he's standing on a globe. Here he's standing on a very curious globe with animals and below that is a fish and he's shooting an arrow at this kind of spectral figure. And in fact, this is symbolic. It's, it's Jahangir triumphing over poverty. So literally he's, he's slaying poverty. And then here we have this wonderful painting. This is one of my favorite paintings. It's Jahangir's dream of Shah Abbas. And here you can see they're embracing, showing some kind of, uh, allegory of unity, of an alliance. And again, though, they're standing on a globe with these animal figures. Again, another interesting art historical aside, and I say this as a now retired professor, is that it's very difficult for modern people to understand the multiple layers of symbolism in early works. We as modern people, tend to ignore symbolism. We deal with things very literally. We don't think in symbolic language. Everything to be, to be blunt is sort of in your face. But a viewer of these works at an earlier time would be able to read all the symbols almost instantaneously. They would all make sense to the viewer. So that's an important thing to keep in mind whenever we look at older works. Now here I've given us uh, a close-up of one of these works. So this is the, the first image. And here you see again, he's standing on a globe. And when I saw this at the museum, I was very curious. I tilted my head to one side. And here I've rotated the image for you 90 degrees to put north on the top. And what we can see is that the artist has actually rendered this globe very carefully. They didn't just make a sort of globe that has land and water randomly, it's an actual copy of some object. And again, that's quite interesting. Again, the painter is Abu Hassan. He's going to be the one that we're going to look at here because he seems to have paid particular attention to these globes. And again, he's rendering a real object. If you look quickly again to the left here, the painting, you can see that obviously this painter has an affinity for again, something that's approaching that Dutch photorealistic style. If you look at these faces, for example, they're actual facial expressions. People look engaged. These are not like the flat medieval figures you might see in Western art from 200 years prior. So you can see there's already this framework for doing a proper rendering of a real object. 
Now here's another one. This is the very curious one where Jahangir is shown slaying poverty. And again, he's standing on a globe. Now this one looks less like a real globe. Also the rendering is flatter, but still there's great attention to detail in terms of the lands and the seas. And again, it has this symbolic figure uh, resting on a fish. And then there's this one, which is really rendered particularly carefully. Again, this is the, the wonderful painting of Jahangir embracing someone. And again, they're standing on animals who are in turn resting on this globe. And we're gonna take a closer look at this one because what's happening here is Abul Hassan has not only included a globe, perhaps by request of the emperor, but he's included what looks like a globe that's actually based on period pieces. That is globes that he likely saw uh, as he was painting. And what interested me was a kind of test of how accurate this was in terms of uh, cartography. Now, before I explain what I'm doing here, I'd like to say something about this because I know there are people in the audience who are very knowledgeable about maps. I actually have always been of the philosophy that you should not match maps one to another, particularly old and new. And in fact, when I gave my Marco Polo talk uh, way back when in Chicago, I said I was fascinated by these very curious maps. They're called the Rossi maps because some of them certainly look like they show renderings of things that they shouldn't like Alaska. But I said, you know, you should never really take a map and say, well, that looks similar to that. And therefore they must be depicting the same thing. However, I broke my rule here because what we're looking at are two maps from the same period or roughly the same period. So here I chose a period map, which is the Cantino map and its depiction of uh, the Asian Peninsula, that is the South Asian Peninsula, and another additional Asian Peninsula that was quite common on maps of this period that dates probably back to Ptolemy. And we notice that the map maker has in fact added that little kind of quirk. So India is represented accurately. Uh, it also looks like Sri Lanka is represented accurately as well in the tip of the frame. And then we see the odd Asian peninsula, the long vertical Asian peninsula as well. So again, one is struck by the fact that the painter is indeed looking at some kind of period map, probably a Western map, but that's something we'll talk about in a moment. Now, here's another one. And this is the one that interested me the most because this painting, uh, first of all, is a very strange painting but it also shows the globe in particular detail. And what we see here, first of all, is this very odd, uh, only semi-allegorical painting. It's Jahangir shooting the head of Malik Ambar. So this is one of his enemies and he had triumphed over this enemy. And so it's this almost primitivist uh, rendering of him shooting an arrow into this dismembered head. It's quite disturbing. And then we also find very curiously this globe in a beautiful stand that once again is sitting on top of an animal, which in turn is sitting on top of a fish. Now, what I'm concentrating on here though, is this globe. Uh, this is a beautifully rendered globe. And again, includes some very particular details. So what I did was, again, I rotated it for the audience. So North is at the top. And what we see here, and I think, again, if any of you have any familiarity with old maps, you can see pretty clearly that, that this is a rendering of the African continent, uh, Europe, and Asia. And it has some other funny details, like it has land up in the North Pole and the South Polar regions. And we'll talk about that. But this is clearly evidence that the painter is interested in cartography and is looking at a piece of cartography of some kind. So the question is, what might he have been looking at when he painted this. And remember, this is taking place in South Asia. It's very far from Europe, uh, but it looks like certainly period maps. So 
doing very crude comparisons, we can see little quirks and details that one can find in European maps of the period. So for example, the Ortelius 57, uh, sorry, 1571 world map, it has a, a little inlet up above the Northeast uh, reaches of Asia. And we see something roughly similar in this globe that's rendered here in, in this painting. Uh, again, we see those peninsulae. We see the South Asia and then another narrow Asian peninsula. Those appear on the Cantino map from 1502 and also in Abul Hassan's painting. And then we see other curiosities such as this lake with an island inside. And we're not sure what that might be, but again, we see hints and suggestions. So for example, uh, the Hondius Atlas Minor of 1607. So again, we're, we're looking at a span of works of about 100 years from 1500 to the 1600s. We see that uh, there is a rendering of a body of water with a large island in. And so again, the conjecture is that Abul Hassan was looking maybe not at this map, but something of this type because there obviously uh, is a great attention to detail here, these different sort of cartographical peculiarities. One of the most interesting and clearest uh, examples where the painter is being very careful about accurate rendering is in Africa. So if we look at the painting, we can again see at left, I've highlighted with those yellow dots the depiction of the river system in the African continent. And then if we look at the right, uh, this is from an Ortelius map of 1612. And again, the Nile is shown in this extensive way branching all the way down to the southern tip of Africa. So again, the conjecture, and I, I frame it as a conjecture, not a theory, was that Abul Hassan was looking at something like the Ortelius map, like the Cantino map, et cetera. And then a very curious uh, addition too, if we look at the upper left, we see Abul Hassan's globe. And we see in that globe, he's included this landmass down to the Southeast corner. And this looks like some of those early renderings of what's called Hollandia Nova. So here's an example of a 1644 map that includes something uh, called Hollandia Nova. And again, it looks like uh, the painter was looking at something like this when he himself included this continent stuck down in the corner of the globe. Now, what's curious is we can also look at this more holistically. Let's look at the globe in its entirety. So again, at the top, we have the globe, uh, Abul Hassan's painting. And if we look at that rendering compared to the Miller Atlas, we begin to notice sort of more general similarities and some things that are different. In particular, what's interesting is that Abul Hassan's painting has the globe including a southern polar region. And you know that's uh, the southern polar regions that appear on early maps is a is a topic that's been discussed to a great extent by people like Chet Van Duzer, et cetera. But what's curious here again is that the painter has included it. And so why might the painter include it? Well, again, there are European maps of that period of 1500 to 1600 who include that. And this is an example. Uh, this is the Miller Atlas as it's called. And it was carried out uh, by two cartographers, uh, Pedro and Georges Reynel. And uh, if we see again here at the bottom, we see this peculiar southern polar region. And we're going to see something like that yet again in a moment. Now, what's curious is we've been comparing this to Western maps, but we can also look at things that are closer to home. So what's interesting is there is a very, very interesting Turkish work called The History of the India of the West According to Recent Discoveries. And it was printed in 1730, but it relies on much earlier information. And it was translated a number of years ago by a scholar named Goodrich. It's a wonderful uh, work. Uh, 
And in it, one of the maps, again, strikes us as roughly looking like Abu Hassan's. And again, it's showing that there's either borrowing or drawing from a common tradition. And again, we see almost the same configuration. Obviously, there's a focus on Europe, Africa, and Asia. But again, we see a southern continent. And in this map, we also see a northern polar continent in both the Abu Hassan painting and this Turkish work as well. So we see that there are a number of common elements and it means that Abu Hassan may have been drawing from multiple sources for different parts of this globe, that this was kind of a synthesis of different influences. Here are larger renderings of these uh, to look at. And again, you can see in the general details, uh, particularly things like the Northern and Southern continents. And then of course, just the choice of view focusing on the oikumene of Europe, Africa, and Asia. Now we can also look at this related to a Persian work because again, now we're getting even closer to home because of course the Mughal empire is in some senses a Persian empire and certainly much of the culture is Persian. And and this is a very interesting uh, map here. And if we look at this, we begin to see, again, some differences, but also some similarities. Here we have not just a, a polar continent, uh, but what we actually have is an all encircling continent. Uh, but again, we see a kind of similar choice of rendering as well. And it makes one wonder, you know, of course, could this painter have been influenced by Persian works or were the Persians kind of intermediaries between European map making and what was going on in the Mughal Empire. So again, it's very curious, the selection here of details. Again, the focus of both maps are Europe, Africa, and Asia. We see the Antarctic and Arctic continents, hypothetical, of course. You'll notice the lower work actually seems to include uh, the New World. And in fact, it looks like it was probably based on a European map um, because it shows North and South America in kind of the Eastern fragments there. Um, but overall, again, we see this interesting choice of configurations. And here again is a close up and as I said before, philosophically, I don't think that matching maps necessarily shows us anything in terms of what's being rendered, but we certainly can get a, a very clear idea that the painter here was looking at a real work. Because again, this is not a random collection of lands and seas. Like if you asked a child to draw a globe, they would just draw some green spaces and some blue spaces and that's it. Here we can see obviously very uh, clear delineations of continents, et cetera. So this is important again, because it shows a painter paying attention to what's going on at that period, scholarly pursuits, cartography, sense of place, et cetera. Now, what's interesting is if we look at uh, Abu Hassan uh, as a artist, uh, we learned something interesting. I, I love the picture at the top. It's actually a portrait of him. And we see him there with his art supplies drawing. And I love this because it, it itself is a very realistic portrayal of a person concentrating intently on a piece of art. And what's fascinating is that this painter, Abu Hassan, he actually did know about Western art. And it is amazing that his earliest work, uh, which he did when he was very, very young, his earliest work was actually a copy of a Durer print. And this still survives. It's in the Metropolitan. And if you look at it, it looks like a piece of Western art. Here it is, study of St. John the Evangelist after Albrecht Durer. And it was done in 1600. So again, he was very, very young when he did this. And it shows that you have artists who understand Western techniques, uh, Western focus on detail, Western focuses on faces. And so it's not a stretch that he would also then be interested in Western cartographical renderings. It's also clear that the emperor himself was interested in European art and prints from Western Europe 
that were being brought into India, particularly by the Portuguese and then later the English. So there was clearly cultural influences from the West. So it's not a mystery that you would have these kind of renderings. There's also some suggestion uh, by a scholar that Jahangir actually had a copy of Mercator's Atlas. And again, if you consider a, a wealthy empire anywhere in the world, there will be this desire to collect things. So just as the British collected things from the Near East and Far East, you also have the Eastern empires collecting things from the West. It's quite an interesting historical artifact in and of itself. So what I would conjecture is going on here is probably a synthesis of sources. As somebody who paints themselves, I can tell you that most painters will work combining multiple influences, multiple styles, and they'll look to create a kind of synthetic whole. So we can only guess at what sources he might be using, but I list here some possible sources. So Ortelius's 1571 map, the Cantino map, which I mentioned earlier, a map of China by Hondius, 1606, and then also these kind of intermediary works. So Arab maps, Persian maps, other South Asian maps, and even perhaps East Asian maps. We can see uh, a Persian work at the bottom left here. That was the one I showed earlier. So again, like any good renderer, particularly somebody who's being commissioned by an emperor, it's most likely that he was trying to maximize his use of sources. And he probably looked at a number of different works, taking bits and pieces from each. So perhaps he took the details of the Indian Peninsula from one source, and perhaps he took the continents in North and South polar regions from another source. So some conclusions. One of the things that I found interesting was we often look at the West as a sort of nexus of curiosity about the world. You know, Western uh, navigators and explorers go out and look for new things. I myself am a world traveler and I feel that I'm sort of based in one place and I go out and look. But in fact, a curiosity about the world is universal. Uh, cultures enter it and depart it at various periods. We all know that China for a long period of time was rather isolated and not engaged with the world. But if we look at things like the Mughal Empire, particularly because of where it's located, we see a marked curiosity about Central Asia, about Persia, about the Near East, about Europe. And maps and globes represent both this curiosity, right? Because there's obviously an interest in Western maps from this you know, subcontinent, but also clearly they represent power and mastery. I also find it interesting that our current culture is obsessed with multiculturalism. We talk about it in a very political and even polemical sense but we actually spend very little time investigating knowledge transmission. I mean, scholars do, and certainly interested independent scholars and map collectors are interested in this, people like the audience. But it's interesting that I'm an academic and I find in academia in particular, there's very little interest in how does this kind of information transmission and translation take place? It's fascinating that there would be an engagement, for example, in this period uh, by Jahangir with the West. What was he trying to learn? How did he actually purchase works? How did he consider the works? What did he even think of the orientation of the works? You know, being oriented with the South at the top or you know, in the Arab style or the Western style with North at the top, et cetera. We actually know very little about the interchange and how this happened, what the motivations were Certainly there were motivations of concern, right? Because they were aware of the Europeans and the Portuguese already coming to India. But the process itself is still not well studied. I hope to study this myself in particular these renderings in a forthcoming paper and hopefully a book. I think there's a lot more work to be done in addressing all the questions that I've outlined earlier. And I hope what I've said today has been of interest and gives the listeners 
some example of this very, very curious intersection of art, culture, and cartography. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Olshin. That was a, a fascinating presentation, um, and it really is fascinating to consider um, the cultural interchange that that would result in, in the depiction of, of maps in that regard. So um, we do have a few questions and answers from folks coming in. Again, if you've got questions for Dr. Olshin, feel free to submit them through the Q&A or the chat box. Um, from Marilyn, what was the symbolism of the lion and the lamb that um, the emperor was standing on? Um, and do, are, is there any relationship to their symbolism in Christianity? Uh, I, I'm, I can only conjecture. So one of the things that I plan to do in this as a project uh, for a book or paper is look at those other auxiliary symbols. So the lion and the lamb certainly is something we find in Christianity. It's possible that it has the same symbolism here as will the fish. Um, it's very curious. Let me actually go back and start with the fish. Uh, I spent a number of years living in East Asia in Taiwan, and of course, in a lot of East Asian mythologies, there's this idea that the world is on the back of a turtle or other aquatic animal. This is one of the areas that I want to investigate, uh, why they have those animals, and why they're being stood upon, which strikes us as viewers as almost bordering on animal cruelty, but there's some sense of this being a, a foundation. So that's all I can tell you. Got it, that's, that's interesting. We're excited to see here what uh, your future research uh, turns up in that. Uh, we've got a question from Bob as far as, how do you, what do you make of the orientation? Uh, it seems like the emperor is standing on the east. Um, is, do you feel like there's symbolism in that or part of a broader cultural context? Um, it's, let me start by answering this way, it's very curious because again, as I'm sure a lot of people in the audience know, usually there's this, this bifurcation that uh, Islamic maps are oriented with the south at the top, Western maps are oriented with the north at the top. And this struck me as odd that all of a sudden you have a map you know, that's oriented with east at the top. It may be symbolic because I'm, I'm guessing if the painter had globes and the globes were already mounted when they came from Europe, they'd be mounted in the normal, quote, standard Western way, which is with north at the top. And so it's almost as if purposefully the painter has done this, perhaps at the request of the emperor, to, to have the symbolism of standing on the East. And of course, the East has lots of symbolism, the rising sun, et cetera. In Freemasonry, it's funny that one of the things Freemasons always talk about is, are you coming from West or East? And the East has a lot of symbolism in, even in, in that sort of modern secular context. So I'm guessing that it's symbolic um, of power, right? As the globe itself is. Fascinating. Um, another question from Joseph. Um, how large are most of these works that we're talking about? And, and elaborating on that, can you just provide a little more context in which these miniatures were issued? Um, were they published in atlases or would they have been designed to hang on a wall? Or um, what were the context in which these paintings were, were done? Well, these ones in particular uh, are from an album. So it was commissioned as a collection of works. And I'm guessing that they were commissioned again for partly for propaganda purposes, partly as a record of military triumphs, exercise of power, but also propaganda. Um, the other thing that that should be considered is when these were commissioned, they were probably only for private use. You know, these are not. Again, we have a modern conception of art that goes into a gallery and then goes in museum. Museum. But you know, prior to the modern period, art was Are you still there? Very small. I mean, in, in crude terms, I Dr. Ocean, we're having maybe some technical issues. You're cutting in and out. Um They're very, very small. Oh, okay. Could you finish that last thought? You were just cutting out there just for the last minute or so. Okay. 
Yes, the, the the paintings are very, very small. I mean, really they're, they're like an A4 size or an eight and a half by 11 size, um, many of these works. So you can imagine how tiny the globe is and how detailed the globe is. And did I see, were there actual individual labels of certain geographic features or script within on the globe itself on one of those? I think one of them may have had script, but most of them have no toponyms. There's no place names at all. There, there are rivers and details like that, but other than that, no, they're, they're blank. Gotcha. Um, question from Tiffany relates, um, could you expand a little bit more on the um, photorealistic element of, Europe, of globes and European maps, particularly with uh, Vermeer? Right, so there, there's, if you're interested in art history, there's a, a huge, debate, a quite interesting debate, because of a book that was written by the British painter Hockney, David Hockney, and he worked with a scientist named Falco, and they developed what they call the Fal Falco-Hockney hypothesis. And what they think is that some of these painters, uh, Dutch painters and also uh, Caravaggio as well, so Italian painters, used a camera obscura to paint. And what that means is that they had live models in a room dressed up posing, and then the scene was lit by sunlight and then focused through a pinhole, right? So a pinhole camera essentially into another room and projected onto a canvas. And that explains the photorealism. So if you're interested in this, there's a book uh, written by David Hockney on this subject. There's also a BBC documentary and that is interesting because it's kind of a hypothesis about where Western photorealism began, which is really early according to that hypothesis. Uh, and if you look at those paintings, they are really remarkable uh, in terms of, of the rendering of the perspective of objects being foreshortened, um, and then the, the kind of detail, the light shine out the globe, the globe itself, because literally, the conjecture is the painter was tracing over a projected image on, on a wall. Do you, agree with, do you agree with David Hockney's findings? Uh, I think there's a, the evidence is very, very good. Um, but also as somebody who paints, I know that painters are, are capable of incredible things just by looking and turning to canvas. Um, so it depends and Hockney himself is a painter. So it, it's a tough call. It's yeah. a tough call. Um, I have one question for you. You had alluded to Jahangir's nickname uh, and that it may have something to do with his relationship to the globes uh, or his depiction of standing on it. Uh, was there anything during his reign that he did uh, to, to like specifically earn that? Did he open up Western communications or, or um, is there anything specific about his reign that would have lended to globalization? Uh, well, I mean, he, he carried out military conquests. Um, the, the one where he's shooting at the dismembered head was an enemy of his that he triumphed over. Um, he conquered a vast amount of territory, but his kind of internationalization, I think, all, also resulted as the reverse, because during this period, the Portuguese uh, are, are in India. They are in uh, Western India. And in, it's, it's the start of the period of Goa is the colony. And so he was also kind of having contact, I guess it probably made him nervous from the West that way. But it's interesting because if you look at, at his reign and also if you look of course at Chinese history, there's not a lot of outward exploration, for example, by sea, which is very curious. So it's not as if he's sending out expeditions to go mapping or anything like that. And you find the same thing I think as everybody knows, you know, in the Chinese tradition, there's really only Zhonghe who is sent out, right? Who reaches uh, the Eastern coast of Africa. But yeah, it's curious that you have, these figures have a kind of global sense, but without really exploring beyond the confines of their land-based empires. It's very strange for, for Westerners who think very much in terms of navigation, conquest of the oceans, et cetera. Absolutely. And I, 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 from what little I know about Asian cartography, at least again, from, from an amateur's perspective, it's fascinating to see how they were less interested in um, authentic geographic uh, representation, that it was, again, yeah. it's always been more stylized. Um, right. 
And, and that's a whole interesting topic because you find, it, you know, through if you look at sort of deep cartographic history and you're a map collector and many people in the audience know this, you find this kind of fluctuation between um, very abstract renderings like the medieval TO maps, which serve sort of a didactic and religious purpose. And then now and then this idea of of actually mapping, right? Creating navigational charts or the, you know, a table of distances. And even in the Western tradition, there's this kind of bouncing back and forth. And it's funny because I, I told somebody the other day, I hate using uh, Google Maps and GPS because to me, that's an abstraction, right? I, what is that? That little snapshot of a three block area that doesn't help me figure out how I'm going from A to B. So even now we're kind of receding into the map as this deep abstraction uh, because we focus on it like this. In cartographic history, it's an abstraction because like you pointed out, these maps without toponyms or highly abstracted maps, yeah, and they serve different purposes, right? So. Fascinating. Um, well, if uh, we'll give folks another minute or two if they have any further questions. Um, again, Dr. Olshan, we can't thank you enough uh, for, for thank sharing this wonderful. And again, folks, for those of you who, who weren't aware, this is all um, first time research. So this is the first time that, uh, from what I understand, anybody's ever heard this. So absolutely. Yeah, cutting edge yeah. stuff. And, and we wish you the best of luck uh, with where it leads. Thank you. And I hope I'll see you all live in Chicago one of these days. And uh, I'd love to come out. I'll have to get myself invited again. So absolutely. Well, we're, we're, we'd love to have you anytime. So hopefully we'll be in the Newberry by uh, September or October. Anytime after that, you just let us know. I hope so. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you, Dr. Olshan. Take care and have a great one. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.